Okay, so the title of this talk is <coughs> What type of shepherd are you to your children? Does anyone know where this is from? This title? Or what it's based on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's based from a hadith. Okay, so it's, the title is not exactly the hadith, but it's taken from the hadith. The hadith in English starts off with every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. And then it goes on, it's longer. Okay, and it details the responsibility of men, of women, uh, even of slaves or servants in the household. And the explanation for the Hadith is actually quite comprehensive. There's loads that we could go into, but the element of children is just one element of it. So, and even that, just talking about children in itself, it's such a huge subject, okay, the, the way in which, um, the, the different ways in which people have raised children in the past, the challenges that we face here and now. But we can't really do it much justice in half an hour or one evening. You know, there's courses that run for like a couple of days and we still can't cover all of the detail that people would need for the specifics of their lives, okay? So in half an hour or the time that we have today, what we're trying to do is just maybe look at some of the key things and maybe give some people a little bit of practical advice about, you know, what kinds of issues are coming up and how might we be able to tackle some of these things. So the metaphor of the, of the shepherd comes up a lot in the Quran, in Hadith, in other places. And it's an inter interesting one because it's not specific to the Islamic tradition, it comes up in other places as well. And it's an easy one to understand, so hence it, it gets used quite a lot. But if you try and break it down, you think, I should have started this off by saying, I'm going to make this interactive. All right, so you're all sitting there looking at me, but you're going to do some work as well. Um, so the metaphor of the shepherd, if you break it down and try to understand what a shepherd does, okay, in the old times when people went out and they looked after sheep and they tended to them, um, that's probably the, the visual picture that most people bring to mind when you talk about a shepherd, right? Something like that. But what type of person can be a shepherd, even just a sheep? Right, this is, it sounds like a straightforward question, but it isn't because uh, I know someone that went to study abroad and um, he was telling me that none of the foreign students were ever allowed to uh, to look after the sheep of anybody in that in that village. All right, and these were mature people; they were men. Um, but they just said Western students just they had no idea because they never grew up with it. And I thought, well, how hard could it possibly be? And he said he tried it once, and he said he never did it again. He said it was ridiculous. So. I'm asking you, what kind of skills do you think that a shepherd would need? Imagine you have a flock of sheep. All right, sisters at the back, you can you can uh, you can contribute as well. All right, have thirty seconds with your neighbour to think about what skills do you think you would need to be a good shepherd. All right, any cattle. If you don't like sheep, choose something else. Cows. All right, but let's go with sheep. <laughs> okay, what do we think? What do we think? Sisters, do you want to offer something first? What kind of skills? Just a couple of things. What do you think? Sisters not want to offer anything. You have to be very responsible, okay, yeah. Resilient. Yeah, you need to be resilient. What else? Patience, a goal, and a plan to get there. Okay. So these are all characteristics, they're not skills. They're all true, but what kind of skills do you think you would need? No? No, so nobody knows. Shepherd is not a skill, right? It's just a characteristic. Okay. So think about it. All right, you've got a group, a group of sheep, right, that you have to go and take out. And 
The sheep have to graze, so they need somewhere to eat. If you let sheep go out to eat on their own, they will eat things that will kill them. They will die from choosing things that look nice to them. Okay? And they won't learn from it. So one of them will do it, will die, and then the next day the other sheep will go and eat from the same thing. All right, and they will die, so they don't learn from it. So you need to understand, we need to understand something about where they get sustenance from. We need to understand something about what kind of risks do they face. They will go and they will wander into areas where there are predators, okay? And they won't even think about it. They'll just be like, oh, the food looks nice over there. If it doesn't kill us, then uh, everything's good. But they'll get eaten. And then they'll go back to the next day. <coughs> so in terms of skills, in the shepherd needs to be able to assess risk. That's the big thing. He needs to be able to assess the types of risk that his cattle, whatever they are, are going to have to face, uh, that they're going to face and that he has to be responsible for. So, uh, one of the early definitions for, um, for taqwa was around assessing risk. Okay? It doesn't get translated as that very much anymore. But that is one of its early meanings. If you find like a classical dictionary, it comes up. So these 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 skills that come from this uh, this job, the shepherd, which is and the shepherd itself is the metaphor that gets used a lot. It still doesn't tell us a great deal about the specifics of what we need to do in order to look looking after children. There's a few hadith, but there's not a great deal of detail about specifics. There's one which um, some of you have probably heard me say it before. It's related from uh, Umar, radiallahu anhu, when he was uh, the Khalifa, that a man came to him and he complained to Umar about the disobedience of his son. And Umar said, well, your son's not here. Go and get him. Come back, and then we'll have a discussion. So the man went off, came back. His son was there. And Umar said to the son, your dad says this, this, and this about you, what do you say? And the son says, you know what, it's all true. And so Umar says, well, and before he says anything else, the son said, but is it not the case that parents have right, that children have rights upon their parents? And he said, yes. So he asked the son, the boy asked Umar, what are these rights? And he said, well, they're three. And he said that a man should choose a good wife, uh, to, to start a family with, he should give the child a good name, and he should teach him the Qur'an. Okay? So three things. So the first two are relatively straightforward, to give a good name, to choose a good uh, wife to have, to have a family with. Those are relatively straightforward uh, to, to understand. And so when Umar said these, the boy said to him, there's quite a lot of detail in the Hadith, the boy said to him, he, doesn't, he didn't give me any of those things. He's explained something about his mom, he explained something about his name, and he said, I don't know anything about the Qur'an. So Umar turned to the father and he said, what do you say about this? He said, yeah, it's true. He said, so you wronged him before he wronged you. All right, so before parents can demand rights of their children, children have rights upon their parents. But the children can't assert those rights because they don't have the articulation, they don't have the uh, cognitive function. These are, some th these are things that parents have to give their children as their rights before children even know that they're their rights or can ask them. So even if they understand it, they might not be able to ask him. So Omar said to him, you have failed in your duty to him before he has failed in his duty to you and you have done wrong to him before he has done wrong to you. <coughs> so the first two of those things are relatively straightforward. The thing about choosing a good wife, the thing about having a good name. But even this, the detail about teaching Qur'an, right, what does that actually mean? All right. So again, I just want you to turn to someone to your left or right and come up with five things that you think teaching the Qur'an could actually mean. All right? We'll give you 30 seconds or so. I'm <laughs> 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 
Okay, sisters, you want to go first? What do we think? Five things. <coughs> No? Okay. Brothers? Sorry, it's important to teach them to understand what they're reading rather than just to read the Arabic. Yeah, okay. Okay, brothers? So we've got to get to five things. That's one thing. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, reading Quran is not just about reading, it's about understanding. Um, without the Quran being the word of God, if people understand, they will know the purpose of their life. So, uh, through various stories, we need to expl explain our children the, the purpose of their life in this world. Okay, so that's a good one. Purpose of life. Okay, I like that one. The other one's good about understanding what you're reading and not just reading it. Okay, so that's two. Three more. Source of guidance. Source of guidance. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so those two are linked, source of guidance, right and wrong. How many is that? Four? Three. The hadith that Aisha says about the Prophet is a walking Quran. Yeah, the hadith. They don't give a great deal of detail around specifics. And so it creates a little bit of a problem for us, but it's also, there's a reason behind it. If we had very dogmatic, very specific ideas around this, they wouldn't necessarily last over different cultures, different times, different people. So we have to sort of reinterpret a, a lot of this in our time, in our place, in our age, for the needs of individuals as well as cultures and people. But that's a problem because somebody has to do it. And probably not one person, but a number of people. So if it doesn't get done, then we, we have a problem. And if it does get done, we might still have a problem if it's not well understood. So we have to, or people cling to things that they have always done before, like their forefathers, which is one of the, the things that you see in the lives of the prophets. When, when the prophets come to them, the thing that they always say, the people that the prophets go to, is, is what? We're just, We're just following what our forefathers, forefathers yeah. right? There's a very human thing to do. So it's still a non-specific answer, and we have to break it down a little bit more to understand the what of what it is that needs to be taught. So more specifically to a couple of the answers that were given is that in terms of guidance, a lot of this work has been done historically. Uh, so it's, it's embodied in some of the sciences that people will probably study, like FIP and Akida in particular. And it comes under the rubric of Fard al Ain, something which is obligatory for people to know personally. Okay, so every Muslim, if he's Balik and if he's Mukhalif, so legally responsible and cognizant, they have to know these things. Okay? Things from like the Ibadat, praying, uh, I should say Salah, Siyam, Zakat, Hajj, uh, the main things, those things don't really change. Okay, they were, they were revealed. There's certain things, you know, you might have particular circumstances that might mean that you can't do something in a particular way or a particular circumstance. That's fine. You know, those things. But those are, those are, those are movements around the edges. Okay, but other things do change. And mainly about our environment. So how do, if, the, if our dad stays the same, how do we relate it to the environment that we're in? 
Okay, how does it come? So coming back to the brother's point, how do we understand the purpose of this in the time and the place that we're in? So the reason that I mention that is because if we believe that Islam is true, and I assume that people do, because otherwise you wouldn't be Muslim, and you want to pass it on to your children and practice it, how is it that is it research projects under and it looked into this extensive bit of research and let me ask you they interviewed I can't remember hundreds if not thousands of people I think it was thousands maybe even tens of thousands and they asked some questions around you know did you grow up as a Muslim in a Muslim environment and then what happened to you as an adult? Are you still Muslim? These kinds of questions. So they found some really quite interesting but disturbing things. So uh, out of a hundred people, how many people do you think were no longer Muslim as an adult? Okay. Was it one? Was it five? Ten? A hundred? Twenty. No, I would say about 65. 65. 65. Crazy numbers coming up there. <laughs> Five percent. No hope. <laughs> Five percent. 95. 20. 20. I said 65. I said 65. It's a very pessimistic opinion of the <laughs> of people in the States. So they found that out of every hundred people that they interviewed, Right, and so remember, this is conservative because people don't always give exactly how they're feeling. So it's a conservative estimate. So out of these hundred people, people who grew up in Muslim families identified themselves by their own admission as Muslim. Twenty-three percent, when they were adults, no longer identified as Muslim. Twenty-three percent. That's one in four people. All right. So how many people are here? Fifteen. So that's probably 12, 13 people. So everyone over this side of the room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was really shocked. I thought, wow, that's incredible. That's really incredible. What was particularly a slight diversion, what was interesting was that they say that the number of people leaving the deen is offset almost exactly by the number of people converting. Right? I was like, wow, that's amazing. Allah says in the Quran in, um, in Surah Muhammad uh, and if you turn away we will replace you with people other than you right it's in Surah Muhammad look it up and he's talking about nations and there's specifics to it as well but I thought wow that is amazing so we can't none, none of us can take this for granted all right they come from Muslim backgrounds they grow up as Muslims. They identify as Muslims, but no longer do when they're when they're adult. The top three reasons that they gave these twenty three percent that no longer were Muslim. The first one was I don't like religion or I don't believe in it. I don't like religion. I don't believe in it. <coughs> that was the top one. The second one was I was raised Muslim, but I don't believe or I never believed. Okay. And the third one was, I prefer the teachings or beliefs of another religion. These are the top three. So don't like religion or never believed in it. The second one, raised Muslim but didn't believe, don't believe now and or never believed. And the third one, prefer the teachings or beliefs of another religion. Okay, so coming back to this thing about what we teach, that much different to the US. So what you could look at instead is perhaps look at things like incarceration rates in the UK, um, something like four, somewhere between four and five percent of the UK population is Muslim. What's the rate of, uh, what, what's the representation in prisons? 18 percent. 7 percent. No, no. Close. 10 percent. 15 percent. And that's gone up from six percent about 15 years ago. So something is really, really not right, okay, in the, in I don't even know what it is. My point to you is that we can't take anything out of this for granted. So we have to. So coming back to the the, the the metaphor of the shepherd, we have to understand better, like what the risks are. I don't believe that any of those people here, with children who are incarcerated, or in the states, with children who leave the dean, 
wanted that for them. All right? I'm sure that if you asked them, they wanted something better. But maybe they didn't do the things to the best of their ability. Maybe they were slightly neglectful. Maybe they didn't teach well or at all because some people don't. So the questions, I think, some of the questions we have to ask ourselves are around, do we teach every child the same thing in the same manner? What happens if they don't respond or don't take it on? And where are we trying to get to with them? We can break this down into more simple questions. What is it that we teach? Yeah. What is it that we teach, the material itself? Why do we teach it? What's the purpose behind it? And how do we teach it? Okay, so the what, the why, and the how of what we teach. There's no real consensus anywhere on how the how of teaching should be done. So people will tell you, oh, you know, in Pakistan we do it this way, in Turkey we do it this way, in Malaysia we do it this way, it's fine, all right? But you can't claim that those things are superior, because how, all right, 15% end up in jail. That is not proof of a good how. Okay? Because we have to assume that the what of what we're teaching is true and is right. Okay? Otherwise, we wouldn't be Muslim in the first place. So, again, to come back to the shepherd metaphor, how do we understand the risks from emulating what they see and hear? So, Perrin, a book on issues around, readily take the focus shifts to high degree of uncomfortable about ourselves. Not only do our children become free of our baggage and burden. Anyone to best hear me, myself, people at times and address them. Other can teach them something, whatever it is. People uh, who are professional and necessarily better than parents are at understanding their children's needs, and they aren't. So if you have a skill, teach it to your children because not only will they benefit from that skill, but it will create a connection between you and, that, uh, you and your child. And that connection is very difficult to create when you outsource the teaching of the child, because you're basically giving the child to someone else to spend seven or eight hours with a day. And it, it's not that it can't be done, but it becomes much, much harder. If they go to school and you teach them stuff at home, then great. But if you've got things that you can teach them, and this is, remember, it's, it's only a recent um, occurrence in, in the modern world where children went to school full time. Lots of them would have spent time with their with their. Uh, boys particularly with their dads to learn the skill and they would inherit that skill to so whatever kind of work it was, if it was a baker or a type of smith. That's how knowledge was passed on, not just the skill but the experience of being with people, of how to be in the world. Can we become the primary example of how to be in the world for our children? Because not all of us are, are, are given children, despite the fact that we might think that we're entitled to it. It's not a biological certainty that it's going to happen. I'm sure that people will know that there are otherwise able-bodied people who can't physically have children. So if you've been given children, we see it as a blessing, but what does that really mean? You've been specifically chosen. You've been specifically chosen. The physical body that you get given which allows you to have children. That wasn't your decision. You didn't do anything to create that. Allah gave it to you. He could easily have given you a body which was incapable. But he gave you a body that was capable, which means <coughs> that he thinks that you're good enough to have the responsibility of having children. Okay, think about it, because it's not, although it sounds straightforward, the consequence of it is serious. Because not everybody gets that responsibility. And there has to be a reason for that. The parable of the shepherd is a little bit limited, if we come back to it. I said at the beginning, sheep don't ever really develop, they don't assess their risk, all right? And they never develop a faculty which allows them to assess their risk. They might get a bit tentative with certain things, but once you see one or two of them going, then you come. And they'll all follow each other to their doom. Like they will literally follow each other to their doom, off the edge of a cliff, they'll eat stuff that will kill them, they'll go into a wolf's lair, they'll kill themselves. So the reason that the parable is a little bit limited when we talk about shepherding animals is because children 
They need that protection and they need that guidance for a time, but they don't need it their whole lives. So while they're protected and while they're under our guidance and they have the safe environment, that safe environment is there for them so that they can learn to be independent and so they can go out and do the things that sheep can't actually do for themselves. The modern society, and it actually doesn't matter anymore where you live, okay, unless you live like in a remote tribal system in the Amazon forest that has no connection to anything, of which there are almost none now anyway. The modern, modern society permeates everything. Like, I don't go abroad very much, but the last time that I went to, um, to Pakistan, I was really shocked by how how much children knew about Western society. And not the good things either, like just rubbish. I was like, well, how do you know this? Like, physically tell me, how do you know this stuff? How do you know these footballers? Like, how do you know these pops? How are they relevant to you? Right? They might have been born in like Hounslow or some of us, and so you might have gone to, we might have gone to school with some of them or know someone that knows them or they're part of our culture, but it's nothing to do with their culture. It's so bizarre. So modern societies, wherever you are in the world, they're more or less the same. Okay, It's the same kinds of issues that are coming up. And so the, the types of issues that are coming up now, wherever we are in the world, they're different to anything that's ever gone before. And so in assessing risk, we have to try and understand what those things are. And we have to try and help children find value in what they do. So value the dean. Okay, but how do we value the dean? So we have to teach them certain things, but how do we value those things? That's part of how do we get them to value what they, the dean amongst all of the other things that are going on. These kids out there in Pakistan who like seeing Britney Spears left and I'm like, what is going on? And I'm thinking, why do you do that instead of all of the other stuff that you could have? I don't know how that becomes so pervasive that they choose to do it, but it has become pervasive, and this was like seven or eight years ago. So I don't know what it's like now. The point is, wherever you are, all of these cultures will have an effect on what you're trying to do for your children. And not all of it is good. So we can't escape it. We can't escape it. We have to accept what that is and work within that and understand that actually the things that our children value are not necessarily the things that we value or necessarily the things that we would like them to have. So our society, the Western society in particular, it values very highly a couple of things, all right? Music, pop music in particular, um, but you know other forms which are probably a little bit more palatable to many of us here. Sport, what else? Milk. Say again? Milk. Yeah, wealth. Food. Food. Food, yeah. Fame. Fame. However you get there, right? Now, it used to be that you have to be talented at fame now. I think probably if you can do daft things, then you can be famous. So sports, music, acting, those, I would say, are three of the biggest things, right? But we're all culpable in this as well, all right? <coughs> hands up if you know, sisters as well, hands up if you know the name of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Anyone? What was his name? <laughs> Ron Williams? No, he was the he's the old one. Robert <laughs> No. Just hands up if you know. Let's have a show of hands. I don't. It doesn't matter if you know or not. Let's see. No one knows. Okay. Hands up if you know the name of the art of the. Um, so that that's a Christian position, but it's the highest Christian position in the country, right? None of us know it. I had to look it up. I knew Ronald Williams, but then I thought, no, he's been superseded. Hands up if you know the name of the Grand Mufti of Bosnia. <coughs> no one knows. Right? Because it's not relevant to us. We don't see it as relevant. He's one of the major figures in Islam in Western Europe. He's written books, he's done lots and lots of different things. We don't really feel it, we don't really see it. Hands up if you know the name of the Egyptian forward that plays for Liverpool. <laughs> Go on. 
Why? Because it's relevant. It's relevant. I don't think people should feel ashamed. I'm just saying that we're all part of this. We're all in this, irrespective of what we might tell ourselves sometimes. All right? Don't be ashamed of that. That's part of the culture that you have. All right? Same as like if you grew up in Pakistan. Like I didn't know the names of all these people, like the pop stars, the Bollywood actors. Right? And people just say, how can we not know? It's like, what's he got to do with me? I don't care like who these people are. Like, I don't watch Bollywood films. I don't listen to Asian music. Someone's like, you've got to watch this. <laughs> so, yeah. no, for years, I was like, no. And then finally, I succumbed. I was like, no. I've proved myself why I never wanted to watch it in the first place. <laughs> right. and, but that's me. Like, if people want to watch it, that, you know, I don't recommend it. But <clears throat> I understand because that's part of the culture of those people. Right? Same as football is here. Football is the national sport of this country and every country in Western Europe. If you know stuff about it, you can't escape it. You can't escape it. It's in your face. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. It is everywhere. But my point is, let's not pretend about the things that we claim that are important, but really aren't. Okay? And the things that we do value, but we're ashamed to say, oh, these are things that you know, I'm into. Right? If you spend inordinate amounts of time watching Champions League or like whatever football or any other sport, it, it, it's a waste of time. It is a waste of time. Unless you're really involved, like in coaching, managing, playing, and there's a very specific reason for it. If you want to watch it in your downtime, I understand that. To like go out and like watch loads of it. No, no, I, I, you know, same with films, anything that you spend in order. Our children are going to be part of that. We have to accept that they're going to be part of it. And so if they value certain things that we don't or are, are alien to us, we're going to have to do a little bit of work to say, you know what, I might not really like that. It's not something that I'm really into. Metaphors in all sorts of sports that kids can use to understand something about discipline, overcoming hard knocks, persisting in something, working in a team, being resilient, all of these things, all right? Those things are learned very quickly and very really in sports, especially competitive sport. Not just going over the park and knocking around with a couple of tennis rackets with your mates and no one can hit it over the net because, you know, we're in practice. But playing at a serious level. So if you're going to do something, then do it and do it well. Okay? Because that will help not just the physical attributes, but actually some of the attributes that we're going to instill to get anywhere near, to have anywhere near a chance. That's patience, that's dedication, that's resilience. All the things that will happen in that time. Injuries, loss of form, people not picking you. Um, this guy, oh, I wanted to give a specific example of like how people value this. There was, um, there was a footballer recently that died, uh, quite young, 30 or 31, Italian guy. Uh, I'd heard of him, I knew who he was, but he's not particularly famous. He played for Italy a few times, so he's probably one of the best players in the country, but you know, maybe best hundred players. He's nowhere near like Ronaldo or Messi or the top guys. And he was captain of Fiorentina, who were like one of the top seven, eight sides in Italy, and he died before a match, cardiac arrest, gone, right? And you think, wow, as quickly as that. Super fit guy, super strong, loved by lots of people. One day before the game, finished. You know how many people went to his funeral on a weekday, in the cold, in the wet, in the middle of Florence? Something like 11,000 people. I was like, it's a Thursday, I'm sure you guys should be at work. But the whole city was like, no, this, the, he's one of our guys. So everyone like, just took the day off. We're going to his funeral. In the weekend's fixtures, Every single fixture in the whole of Europe had like a minute silence for this guy. Most people had never even heard of him, but it was observed. So I was thinking to myself, this is amazing. You know, if Justin Welby, who's the Archbishop of Kent, could have told you his name now, if he died, would you even know? If the Grand Mufti of Bosnia died, would you even know? But if Mo Salah died, oh my gosh. 
everyone would know. Probably people would go to Anfield and like leave flowers for him, Muslims, right? Because that's what people do. That is part of what our culture is. So, sorry, I wanted to go over some key points, some practical points actually to um to think about. Four things, uh, but before that, just to, re uh, to restate, invest time in yourself. All right, if you don't have things that you can teach your children, or if, you're, if you think there are things that you can teach but you're not quite there, invest time in yourself to do it. And that's why I'm saying things like watching lots of football, lots of films, forget it. All right, yeah, those have a point and a place. I like football, I like films, but just concentrate on the things that you need to do. All right, make that time for yourself. If you've got skills, then go and do it. If your children are growing up, can you do it for other people? All right, create those connections with your own kids. Invest time with them. That's the, uh, and it's led to the first one. Spend time with your children. And not just like being on your phone and pushing them on the swing at the same time. Spend actual time with them. That means putting your phone away, not being on the internet. Block time out. If it's a Sunday afternoon, do constructive things with them, all right? So you might be, it might be the whole family together, so mum, dad, uh, daughter, son, play games, um, have specific things that you're going to do, even if it's going for a meal and you chat about stuff, but spend constructive time with them from when they're young, from when they're young, all right? Because then it becomes a habit, and that's what they're accustomed to, and they feel that that's one of the avenues in which they get to know that they can trust you, you can talk about stuff. All right, constructive board games, things like Scrabble. Um, there are loads of things out there now. There's, there's so many, I'm really, really surprised. It allows them to explore from a safe environment. Okay, they feel like they can trust you and that they can, they can, um, they can ask you things. Something that, uh, so that's the first one. Second one, something <coughs> that people don't really think about is how we communicate and the language that we use. Um, you probably picked up from uh, the poster for this, I have a bit of a background in sports coaching and one of the big things that we talk about <coughs> is how we get messages across is a huge thing, okay, because sports, professional sportsmen, lots of them have this idea that because they were professional sportsmen they can go and coach. Some of them become the worst coaches you've ever seen. You wouldn't believe how they interact with children. It's so inappropriate. And they don't see it because they think, well, I've played, I'm trying to get this across. It makes no difference. You have to understand how do you communicate the correct points that a nine-year-old needs or a 10 or a 12 or a 15-year-old, right? Use positive language with children. <coughs> Use positive language. Think about the amount of time you say to your own children, don't do this. No, don't do that. I don't like this. These are all negatives. Right, they can all be changed. Turn it 180 degrees. Instead of don't do that, how about you try this instead? Have you given that a try? Why don't you do this? All right, have a play with that and really, not everyone does it, but sometimes, you know when you go out to the park and you hear people talking and you just kind of cringe. How can you talk to people like that? Even adults you wouldn't talk to like that, but like children, please. So in this day and age, children are not resilient. There was a time in which you could be very directive, very authoritarian with them, and just say, just do it. It doesn't work very often. It doesn't work very often. Okay, there might, and of course I'm not, I'm not saying never do it, because you know, if your child's about to put his hand on a burning cooker, you know, I say, well, son, you know, how about you take us? It's too late, he's already burnt himself. <laughs> right? You're going to just grab him, and he's probably going to scream or cry, and then you'll explain, and he'll probably still hate you for a while, but it doesn't matter. You know why you've done it. But in everyday situations, try and turn that terminology around. Okay? Have examples of things that you would like them to do instead of the things that you don't want them to do. Give them alternatives. Okay, that's the second one, language and communications. Dive on technology. Lots of people have 
asked about this, not me directly, but online. There's just this awash with stuff around technology. I can't even read this because it's so sort of um, emotional and uh, scaremongering a lot of this stuff. There was a, there was a <coughs> report recently done by uh, the London School of Economics around the use of technology and how productive it is in homes. All right, which is totally the antithesis of like what you normally hear. Too much screen time, too much video games. Video games make my children violent. So what they basically said was, if we use technology appropriately, and we can't lump, we can't, we, we need to differentiate between different types of technology as well. So TV is one thing, games is something else, internet is something else. All, right, all of these things, uh, and, and then within the internet, then you've got lots of different things as well. Have strong ground rules about how much time and what for. If you need it for homework, you need it for homework. You can't escape that. But what about other things? Can you use it to watch films? Well, yeah. But screen those films. All right. Make that time to watch stuff with your children yourself. All right? This comes back to our thing about investing time with them. Have, take an interest in the things that they're interested in. All right. You might not particularly like watching a shark documentary for the 50s, and this is one of the ways of doing it. Films, there's, there are two or three websites online, uh, run by, uh, one of them, at least one of them is a Christian organization, The filters and says, it gives you like different levels, like is there a lot of swearing, is there lots of inappropriate content, violence, all the things that you know, parents want to think about. Have a look at those things, but if you have to watch it yourself, watch it yourself, okay, because some stuff which, Seems appropriate, I'm telling you, it's nowhere near. And people say, oh yeah, do you see that? I'm like, no, we're not watching that. It's just, it's just nowhere near. And of course, this is age-specific. Children mature at different rates as well. Okay? But don't get into the mindset that technology is all bad. Because some people are out there saying, no, there's too much technology. If they want to play a bit of Xbox, FIFA, then how have they got time? All right? If they're at school all day, and they want to play half an hour on Xbox, you've been on this forever. Just let them have a bit of time with it. Right? But have ground rules to say that actually you know what's too much as well. And agree perhaps, especially for young children, beyond a certain time, doesn't matter. You know, all right? Uh, something that I heard last one on this was that uh, one of my own teachers he did this with his children and he's home educating five or six children. He said that children should not get given any device of their own which has internet access before the age of 15. I'm not saying I agree with that. That's his standard for his family. Right? Because you cannot police it then. Once you do that and they have the privacy of their own room or they're out, who knows? Who knows? And I don't you don't need me to tell you like the, the, the stuff that's available is is just horrendous. Um, and then the last one was just around getting kids to be active. I see a lot of kids who are like overweight, who are a bit slow, they're not coordinated even. I think just get them playing a sport. For the reasons that I gave earlier, sport in particular has very immediate and very tangible effects on people's development. So um, my, I mentioned that my background was in football, I do a lot of sports coaching in football, I'm interested in a couple of other things. People used to say to me, because my son doesn't particularly like football, you must be so upset. I'm not upset. <laughs> I'm not upset. He likes what he likes, and I'm happy that he likes it, because if I force him into like certain things, He's doing it for me, not because he likes it or is particularly good at it. If he ends up being particularly good at something else, I'm doing that. Because for me, it's actually about what you learn out of it. Okay, how strong can you be? I don't want him to do something that I like and then he becomes mediocre. Let him do something that he's good at, that he's strong in, and that he will develop. And he can use to understand his own development. But get children active. Get them active. It, it has so many benefits. It's just it's very difficult to... Uh, to elucidate all of them. If they incline towards a particular thing and you don't particularly like it, just let them try it. Okay, because sometimes kids will like something or not like it and it will be a little phase. Quite often, especially for young children, it's social. Do their friends play? If their friends play, they want to be there. 
Right. And once their friends stop, they're kind of not really involved. And if they are, then you think, okay, that's something that we can cling to. It's really important that we all step out of our comfort zones and raise ourselves. No one is going to do this for us. No one is going to raise your children. No one is going to be as strong for your children as you are. Okay, nobody, no matter how well qualified, what professional they're in, you can be the one, I can be the one who can do this better than anyone else. Okay, don't be, don't allow your own neglect to be the reason that they go off and do crazy stuff. Be the example that you want your children to see. Wouldn't it be the thing, wouldn't you feel proud as a parent to say, to have your child when, they, when they're growing up and someone asks them, are you proud of your mum or your dad? What do they do, which is really good? And they're happy, they're like, no, I don't want anyone else. My mum does this, my dad does this. I don't need so-and-so, all right? That comes from you being strong in the things that you do and doing them well. Because children understand brilliance. They gravitate towards beauty and strength, generally. Assess risk now and in the future as far as possible and work on it. So be the best shepherd that you can be for your children. Questions? Questions can you pass the mic on? <coughs> or if there's no questions now, you're thinking of food, yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's yeah, food. Rounds. Yeah, food will be served yeah. afterwards, so if there's no questions now, then you're welcome. <laughs> Is that a question of that? I don't have personal experience of that, <laughs> so it'd be wrong for me to say, you know, this is a solution. I don't have solutions to lots of like specific things that people are going to have in their lives, like multi having having a number of children. Um, so a couple of people in my family have lots of children. They have the same sorts of issues. I think the thing there is that you really need other people around you to assist. And then that comes down to, do you trust those people to take charge of your children? Which of them needs your attention? And which of them could you leave to their own devices? <clears throat> and which could you give to other people to, to try and look after? In those times, you know, not um, indefinitely, but just in those times. Um, I think that's why we really need to have people around that are going to help support you know, because even with one or two children, it's really, really difficult, if, especially if both parents are working, which is very, very common, is how do you find that time to do things even for one or two children? Um, I, I don't really know what the answer is other than to try and use up people around. If your older children are old enough to look after some of the younger ones, then that's something as well. And obviously you'll have to reward them in some way because they're not going to do it for nothing on staff. Um, but that's what I would. Just that, what made me think of it was when you were saying that you know there are things to watch and you can you know go about the good things to watch. I put it out. I put it out. I'm looking for things. One poor child, one poor child. I don't watch this one together. I don't know what I'm watching this one together. I don't even have time to watch one. What the information? I don't know. Maybe there's someone else in here that can offer you some uh, practical <laughs> advice around how you. Don't spend your whole day watching films. I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is, honestly. Um, maybe you have to find a compromise. You know, a certain day you do a film for one child. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm thinking on the spot about what I might try and do. That's probably what I'm trying to do. Um, I don't know what you would do without a compromise. I think we should watch superhero films. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I think is anything that's good or enjoyable for a child is normally addictive. That could be whether it's pop drinks or whether that's fast food or whether that's anything technology. It is a, there's an element of addiction that is the fear of any parent. And it's that addiction that parents have difficulty in controlling. So those things are all good, but they become addictive for the child because the way these things are marketed, the way they are presented, uh, are addictive for adults, let alone for <coughs> So for <coughs> parents who are trying to grapple in terms of raising their children, is how do you give them something that's quite addictive and say to them, it's not now, you're not only, you're only allowed to taste it, but you're not allowed to gulp it, if you, if you see that, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, and, and it's those kind of hurdles that parents have. And, you know, I, I, can, you know, I can give an example. I mean, I, I, I see a difference. I, I was a martial artist and I hated football. And I never wanted my child to like football. So I grow up and my son grows up. And at the age of 30, 11, 12, he suddenly loves football. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to get you into martial arts, but you like football. I don't want you to like football. I don't want to buy these shirts. <laughs> and I don't want to do it. And next thing you know, uh, I realize that this is a love that he's got. So I started playing football with him. I've got two left feet. I'm 52 this year. But I play football. And so I made a compromise within myself. So it's, that's, that's great, alhamdulillah, yeah. That, that's something that I was able to find in within myself. But right. I, I think it's important to recognize that's not common. No. It's not common. People won't necessarily do that. No, I realize that, you know, why, as you said earlier, my son loves something, so why should I deny him something like that? Mm -hmm. And also, for example, football has great traits in terms of social interaction that we Muslims sometimes forget. You know, I remember growing up, in the 70s and 80s, and I used to fight these guys. They were bloody hooligans, and they were always be racist. Uh, you know, and that's why my hatred for football came from. You know, I, I grew up in Sheffield. There was two two teams, mm -hmm. uh, and neither of them had any positive impact on me. But I think times change. We we have to change, and I think I find a lot of pleasure now playing football because I'm with my child. I'm 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 enjoying something that he enjoys. Uh, the opposite of that would be me being home and not being involved with him. And I, I know one thing that my life is, you know, a year comes very, very quickly. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't feel an, uh, a week. It merges in the next week. So I've realized that, you know what, embrace the love of my child and then I can spend more time with him. Yeah. And we can both benefit in the short life that we have. And mm -hmm. I found the love that's, that's been beneficial for me. Okay. Yeah. I think just to add to that, so if you know you're talking about addiction, yeah. you can obviously control addiction. So <coughs> and if, you're, if you're watching a film yeah. and you've got a curfew of 30 minutes, yeah. then you can incentivize it. And I think we should use incentives more. Whereas if you get this bit of work done, then you can watch the next part and then be part of that journey. Yeah. Um, he, they might hate you initially, but they'll hopefully you see the greater goal. Um, as long as long as you're not stopping them from doing it, or you're not. Yeah. If you promise them something, they have to fulfil it as well. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they will turn against you. I think. Yeah, so yeah. maybe use it in a way that will benefit you and the child. It is addictive. That, that word, that word is addictive. addictive, and that's the issue. We we don't we can't control addiction. It's it's a big problem in the West. You know, whether that's narcotics or, or whether that's internet or whether that's something even far worse. The fact that it's called addiction is something, it's because we can't control it. And we, we only have a certain parameter whereby we can put our strength towards it. But at the end of the day, it's going to take its natural course. And, you know, I'm just giving my own example at home. My, son's play on, my son plays on, on, on PS4, but it's never enough time for him. You know, he, he has to be dragged away from it. You know, he, there's never enough time for his mobile. You know, he has to be dragged away from it. And it's always a little fight. Because it is addictive. You know, it's, it's a difficult... I think it's also, I mean, the social circle, maybe, 
because th- that has a big influence on what yeah. you enjoy as a child. I mean, if we go back to our experiences when we were young, it's what the people, what was trendy and what was cool then. But if you have, I don't know, a Muslim group that, you know, have the balance there, then it might not look so cool all of a sudden. You're just, a, I think you're just a bad player, aren't we, we can carry on. We can carry on over dinner, inshallah. Yeah, he's, sorry. He's, he's, he's taught me Arabic, so he's, I, I know he's very to the point, practical, real with things. I don't know, appreciate that. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I think first I'd like to say a few words about some of the courses around. Uh, go on. <laughs> I say it making hands. So. <laughs> Gee. So we've got a youth course starting. I can see a lot of youth there, including you, Asif. Um, <coughs> but you don't fit the age group. <laughs> age group. So it's from 11 to 17. It's like a Tarbiya course. Um, it's going to be six weeks long, 4 to 3 p.m., inshallah. And it's going to be covering a lot of interesting modules. Like, for example, what does it mean to be a British Muslim? Is going to cover cleanliness, which is very, very important. Um, and it's going to cover a, a lot of <coughs> things, some of the things that we discussed about today as well, um, like sort of the, the ills of social media. So, you know, things can be very good in social media, things can be not so good. So there's quite a lot of exhaustive um, content that we'll be going through. So if you're interested, come and see me. You can register, inshallah, from uh, Sunday. Uh, we talk by start for us, um, and uh, he's our Hamim Quran school teacher as well, uh, and he's a good teacher for for this type of content with children. Other than that, we've got um, coffee mornings in Shilla starting. So now we're moving to the that generation. <coughs> um, so, <laughs> auntie, this <isn't> you. <laughs> so, so this is again something that our uncles and aunties, you know, are very honourable. Uh, people and uh, mashallah they came and they've been saying for a while you know that we want something we can chit chat have some tea coffee some more so we're going to be starting that inshallah from next saturday uh, and it'll be every fortnight approximately gee um so it's free it's open for everyone so bring your friends bring all the other aunties as well inshallah um so yeah so, so that's it those two events inshallah I won't hold you long enough. I've got food coming, so. Perfect. Inshallah, if the ladies could make their way downstairs, uh, the ladies' food will be served downstairs. And if the men could just pull this way a bit so the ladies have space to get out, and inshallah, we'll serve in there. Thank you.